from all over the world. Uh, my name is uh, Stefano Sartorio, and I'm the vice president of uh, Mondo Internazionale, an international organization powered by youth, which operates in the field of cultural diplomacy and international cooperation. On behalf of the organization and of its president, Professor Michele Pavan, I wish to greet all the international youth connected through the World Youth Forum today and here to listen at our event. I also wish uh, to thank our amazing panelists, uh, Professor Alessandro Cocchi, agroeconomist and lecturer of development economics at the University uh, of Florence, and Catherine Ray, director of our division Mondo Internazionale, GEO, for their valuable contributions. How do we think about our future if we don't consider our food systems? If we understand our world, we do see different economic models, innovation patterns and cultural specificities. But we can be sure that at the basics of all of these, we will always find food systems. Food is what gives us life, what makes us grow, what enables entire populations to plan for their future and produce innovation that will benefit the whole humanity. That is why intelligent and resilient food systems must be a top priority for our generation while cooperating in building tomorrow's world. But the COVID-19 pandemic and other international crises also connected to climate change have proven us that much more should be done to efficiently handle our food systems. We must work together to prevent future crises in this regard. And this is the reason why we gather all of us here today. With Mondo Internazionale, we strongly believe that cooperation among young generations with the support of the institutions, universities, and enterprises can effectively contribute to positive outcomes when we talk about global challenges. We believe that inclusive agriculture, food production, and innovation can create jobs and eliminate hunger in rural areas globally, giving people a chance to feed their families and live a decent life. With this event, we aim at raising awareness among the young generations on the great opportunities in the agri-food sector, and also the responsibilities that this sector carries towards the civil society and global economy. Now, leaving the floor to our panelists, I wish to thank you all again for being here today ready to empower ourselves to build the positive change we want to see in the world tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Gloria Marinsanti Wakihembo, Deputy Secretary General of Mondo Internazionale, and I am today's moderator of the extraordinary multi-generational panel we are presenting to you today. So hello and welcome everyone to today's World Food Forum side event food systems as global economy accelerators. We are honored to have Professor Alessandro Cocchi, agroeconomist and lecturer of development economics at the University of Florence. Uh, with more than 40 years experience in international development and with particular focus on the national and regional programming and identification, formulation and evaluation of rural development programs frequently responsible for leading international multidisciplinary expert teams in social oriented and institutional strengthening projects in poor and vulnerable social contexts. And welcome to the second panelist, Kathleen Rabe, with a bachelor's degree in international studies from the Ohio State University and a master's degree in international relations from the University of Milan, current research director of Mondo Internazionale Geo. So let's introduce today's event. Why food systems as global economy accelerators? Well, according to World uh, Bank uh, 2021, global extreme poverty rose in 2020 for the first time in over 20 years as uh, the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic compounded the forces of conflict and climate change, which were uh, already uh, slowing poverty reduction progress. And about 120 million additional people are living in poverty today as a result of the pandemic, with the total expected to rise to about 150 million 
to the end of 2021. And the economic crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic is also expected to contribute to global unemployment for more than 200 million people next year with women and youth workers worse hit. So the rising competition for scarce water is driving tensions and conflicts among stakeholders and exacerbating equalities or better say inequalities in access to water, especially for vulnerable populations, including the rural, rural poor people, women, indigenous populations uh, globally. So these are some of the issues, unfortunately, that we are all facing nowadays, but uh, food systems and an inclusive agriculture, food production and food innovation can create new jobs and eliminate hunger in rural areas globally, giving people the chance to feed their families and live a decent life. So today we are going to talk uh, globally and we are going to talk locally. So first of all, uh, let's talk uh, locally about the local economy. Uh, and I would like to ask our panelists, um, food systems as global economy accelerators, what does it mean and what is the effect of food systems development on the local economies? Professor, would you like to begin? You're muted. Uh, do, do you hear me No. Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will try to answer to your question, uh, Gloria. Uh, what is the difference from a local focus and a global focus, talking about food systems? Uh, I, for, first of all, I would like to stress that a, a local economy is mainly based on smallholder farmers, <clears throat> talking about Africa, talking about Latin America, in the majority of the areas of both Africa and Latin America, uh, the majority of the farmers are smallholder producers. This means that their family economy is mainly based on self-sufficiency. Uh, in orientation toward the global economy would involve a complete change in uh, economic patterns and cropping patterns as well. Global economy means specialization, high quality of production, low cost of production, high capital intensive production. And this is just the opposite of a self-sufficiency economic based farming uh, system. A food system based on self-sufficiency is high labor intensive, low capital intensive, and uh, self-consumption self oriented. So a, a, a global economy is generally completely different from a globalized economy. This doesn't mean that we have to avoid to orientate the local economy toward global, global economy because the global economy means new opportunities, that's fine. But we have to take into consideration the constraints of local economy and, they, and to what extent local economy is exposed to uh, external shocks, natural shocks or market sh shocks. Uh, I, will, I will take again the subject maybe later. I will leave the, the, the floor. Thank to, you very much. To, to Thank Catherine. you very much for your I will answer. develop a little bit later these concepts in a way. Thank you. So, Caitlin, would you like to uh, add something to the answer of the professor about global and local economies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, because I think what the irony of the title of this event uh, is, is that the title 
food systems as global economy accelerators. Maybe we take for granted that a global economy acceleration is going to necessarily lead to a benefit throughout all facets of society, especially at the local and smallholder level. Um, but it's not always and necessarily going to be accompanied by a local benefit or a local or a benefit for, for the individual, for example. And I think the professor has obviously 40 plus years of working in the global south and the way that this is reflected in the global south throughout the past uh, decades. But I think uh, what is really interesting is that it's a mirrored effect uh, from the global south and within the global north. Uh, and I can uh, say this from experience that having grown up in the Corn Belt of the United States, for example, we're talking about the United States, a country that is more than self-sufficient in terms of food production, it produces enough for its entire population and for the populations of other countries. And so what this has led to is an acceleration of the national and of, a glo of the global economy. But at the same time, the irony and the great paradox of middle America anymore is that the same place where you find these massive fields of, of corn or soy, for example, aren't necessarily places where the farmers or the local people can access the healthy food, for example. And they're not necessarily the parts of America where the economy is thriving. And so I find this to be a very interesting mirrored effect between the global south and Alessandro's experiences in the, in the global south, but also a very related effect with a completely different image in the end with a completely different uh, result in the end within a country like the United States. Uh, and uh, as Alessandro said, I think we're going to keep this theme throughout the entire event. So I'll, uh, I'll leave the, the word back to you, Gloria. Thank you very much. We are surely going to talk more about this topic. Uh, I would like to welcome our audience. I saw someone already greeting us. Welcome on board of this event. Feel free to uh, ask questions throughout the event and we will um, answer them at the end of the event in the last 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for participating. And now we uh, are going to the second question for our panelists. So we were talking about global and local economies and uh, how does the food system impact on the current international dynamics. Uh, would you like to um, give some example of what is happening uh, with the current situation uh, in food systems? Maybe even uh, referring to what happened with COVID-19 and uh, the, the whole global situation. I leave the floor to our panelists. May I start? Yes. Mm. I would like uh, to turn your question upside down, <laughs> sorry. I would like to start talking about to what extent global economy can affect local economy. And then the other way around. Uh, I, I would like to make you an example. You were asking for examples, so. Uh, more or less 20 years ago, at the end of the 90s, more or less, uh, Vietnam uh, became one of the major players in the coffee sector. Uh, they, be, they, they are actually the first or the second coffee producer in the world. And they, uh, at the end of the 90s, they flooded the international market with coffee not high quality coffee at the beginning, but a lot of coffee. And the price of coffee, the international price of co coffee went down. And these affected uh, many coffee producers countries traditionally not used to compete on the international market with other players like Vietnam. And at that time I was in Central America in Honduras and I remember that the majority of the producers and the coffee uh, producers cooperatives were very, very worried about their capacities. 
to survive uh, to the um, to the this external shock. Uh, this means that uh, uh, when you deal with uh, a more main commodity like coffee, for example, you are exposed to external shocks, either natural shocks like a hurricane or a, a, a decrease, a, a quick decrease in international prices of the main commodity you are dealing with. So uh, this means that the small producer, the small producer, if it is not open and flexible to change quickly his cropping pattern, if he, he is not diversified in his plot, he risks to be impacted by the consequence of the global economy in a way that he will not able, be able to survive. Definitely, all recent studies about food insecurity in Central America demonstrate that the people most exposed to food insecurity are just the small coffee producers, which, are, which base their economy on uh, coffee and no other crops because they rely on a cash crop only and not on vegetables, fruits, and uh, small animals, and so on, in order to have a diversified um, family econo economy. This means that if you are a small producer and you want to face the challenge of the international market, you have to be well equipped in terms of cropping pattern, in terms of uh, association, producers associations, or cooperatives, access to services like credit, insurance, and so on, that many times are not present in the third country or in the not developed or in the developing countries. Um, when Kathleen was mentioning the core belt, we also have to take into consideration that that's for sure, the core belt is not, is a typical globalized production model uh, open to the international market. But at the same time, the, the local producers have access to a lot of services like credit, insurance, technical assistance, state subsidies, and so on. While the small producers in the third world are not, are not open, are, they do not have access to these kind of services. So, uh, the impact of globalization in the, in the north of the United States can't be the same uh, in, the, in the south of the world. Uh, to what extent, to what extent uh, local economy in the third world can impact on the, on the global economy, the other way around? Uh, there is the possibility for the small producers to organize themselves in associations cooperative with the help of the international cooperation or development in order to strengthen their capacity to face the challenges of the international market and to reinforce their ability in terms of management, uh, production techniques, good practices and so on in order to to restructure the value chain and to make the added value more closer to the production and not to commercialization. Uh, so the restructuring of the value chain is basic for making globalization benefiting also the small producers. Thank you very much. In fact, global value chains are so fundamental uh, for the food systems and to, in order to preserve the local population. Caitlin, would you like to add something to the answer of Professor Cocky? Yeah, so uh, just like Professor Cocky, I think I'm going to separate this into two different parts because uh, Professor Cocky was also speaking about uh, the theme of specialization and hyper-specialization and that uh, Specialization in a country like the United States or in 
for example, European countries is uh, financially sustainable for the producers because the producers have access to things like crop insurance, for example. Um, which, uh, for example, giving me a case of India, and India small, uh, a smallholder based in India is uh, susceptible to uh, price variations in a crop uh, that are 20 times uh, more volatile than uh, the price variations in the United States, so just to give an example, because uh, of the fact that an American farmer is protected by insurance. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is the negative effect of uh, the tendency towards the specialization that we see as a part of a globalized food system. But at the same time, it's not that uh, globalization can be considered, uh, globalization of the food systems anyways, it can be considered neither a positive or a negative thing. We have to think about uh, how it's implemented just like any other paradigm. And so uh, just as Alessandro was saying, if we think about, for example, smallholders uh, in the global south, uh, if we can give them, uh, or if they have uh, the tools in order to uh, form a cooperative, for example, they're going to be much less likely to face uh, such a volatility in the prices. Uh, and uh, they al it also gives them a greater platform to speak uh, on a political level, on an international level. So for example, if uh, I'm buying a, a spice that's been imported from a cooperative in Indonesia, that definitely is going to have a, a beneficial effect for the smallholder based in Indonesia. But if we are focusing globalization on specialization efforts and on just producing more with one farmer, that's not going to lead to a greater benefit for that farmer or for the consumer in the end. So essentially we have to be very attentive to how a globalized food system is implemented in the end, as opposed to saying it's a positive or a negative paradigm. Yes, uh, I agree. So um, specialization of food systems is indeed a precondition of globalization. And uh, um, according to you, what are the trade-offs of specialization in the global economy? You are My muted. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, specialization means different things. Uh, you, uh, the requirements of a globalized market are high, as I told you before, high quality in, in terms of production quality, uh, low cost of production, and high capital intensive pr production. Uh, but there is also another aspect, quality and uh, in terms of organization, production, a food system facing the challenges of the, a globalized market must be strengthened in terms of organization. They have to be able to organize themselves in terms of uh, work organization, uh, value chain organization, post-production, post-harvest, uh, handling, packaging, uh, transport, uh, dealing with all the uh, with all the requirements of export chain and so on. And, and this is not uh, affordable for small producers alone, and in many ca cases, not on not even for their organizations, which are not very well funded, not very well organized, cut off from the main uh, roads. Uh, and that's why uh, th there is another aspect, technological aspect. Uh, for example, if you want to produce maize for the international market, you have to produce in bulk, you have to produce a lot of maize uh, and to supply the international market with a constant quantity, a constant supply. And this requires a, a high technology, hybrids, for example, hybrid seeds. 
hybrid seeds require a lot of fertilizers, pesticides, and uh, uh, chemical inputs in general, which are not affordable for the smallholder farmers. Many times hybrids are much more vulnerable to drought, to, uh, to high rainfalls, to high uh, uh, precipitations, and uh, in, in many cases, local varieties result to be much more resistant to uh, pests, disease, drought, and other adversities. Less produce, they, the yields are less than uh, what you could, uh, you could obtain with an hybrid. Uh, yields are generally not matching standards or international requirements, but at the same time, they represent a sort of insurance that anyway you will produce something. Uh, the dependency of the international market for the supply of hybrids make the small producer totally depending on the international market and external supply of uh, agricultural inputs. And this open uh, the room to uh, propose another subject, which is the food sovereignty. Food sovereignty means the capacity of a community to have control of the agricultural inputs, the uh, agricultural way to access market, and uh, the access to land, credit, and capital. This capacity is hampered by the globalization in, because uh, international market offers everything, but in order to have access to the international market, you have to have basic requirement in terms of uh, access to capital, access to communication, access to roads, access to uh, institutions, and so on, which is not affordable for the small producers. It is not affordable. It is not uh, possible. Uh, for the majority of the local communities in rural areas in the south of the world. Yes, so, that's an issue. Exactly, exactly. So uh, they, in order to access global market, you have to rely on a number of requirements, a number of uh, items that not all the local communities, not all the rural communities are in the position to, to have or to obtain. And anytime they try to address their food system toward the global market, many times they, they, they fail or they have consequences in terms of shocks vulnerability and increase of food insecurity. It is not so easy to change the pattern and to address a local community which is mainly based and traditionally based on self-sufficiency and self-food production toward a monetary economy, which is a completely different pattern. Global economy is based on financial economy local economy is based on kind food and uh, exchanging kind uh, which is completely different it, 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 i would say from the anthropological point of view as well and this is another story of course and it will be really interesting to hear yes uh, yes yes yeah maybe we'll talk about it uh, later uh, Caitlin, would you would you like to add something to the food sovereignty topic? Yes, uh, um, uh, I've been doing a lot of reading on the topic of food sovereignty, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really interesting that we can find uh, 
many different definitions, but there is maybe more of a grassroots or activist uh, branch uh, uh, that defines it as the ability of uh, each individual to control how his or her food is produced, what type of food they are eating. And there, is, there are many different types of food sovereignty, but I think uh, the most uh, agreed upon definition is also that of uh, a nation being able, or a group of people being able to decide uh, or having self-sufficiency in regards to food. And uh, I think uh, Alessandro gave uh, some examples in regards to technologies and rural peoples being able to access uh, the technologies necessary to produce certain types of crops. Uh, I'm going to take this a little bit more into the political realm, for example, and uh, speak about the role of uh, food security and food sovereignty in uh, geopolitics these days. Uh, and uh, essentially what we're seeing, for example, especially in this, uh, these last couple of years is the idea of food sovereignty being an important development in uh, international agreements uh, and in relations between countries. So, and I think of the example of uh, China, for example, that has a, a population that essentially is very difficult to, to meet their elementary needs, that their food needs. And so uh, if before China also depended on the United States in part for their food needs, uh, recently, because that supply has been cut off, as we can say, China has found other ways uh, to meet its uh, own food needs uh, and thus uh, obtain food sovereignty or self-sufficiency in regards to uh, their food production. Also uh, in uh, by going to nations in Africa and receiving some of their food uh, production from African nations. So, and so I think uh, we take for granted the importance of food sovereignty in international relations that we see today. So Alessandro spoke about this on a local level. I'm taking this also to more of a global international level. Um, uh, so yes, uh, uh, another way in which we see, I think uh, the uh, local being mirrored in a certain way on a global level or the situation in the global south also being mirrored in the global north uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, so we were talking about um, free trade agreements, international dynamics. Uh, Professor Kocki, would you like to add something to the topic of uh, multilateral and uh, uh, free trade agreements, uh, regional agreements and uh, what are the current dynamics in the, in, on the topic? Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert in food trade, in uh, trade agreements. Uh, what I can say is just, according to my experience, that uh, there are different approaches. Uh, the United States, for example, always prefer to negotiate uh, free trade agreements state by state, uh, individually, unilaterally. Uh, the approach of the, of the European Union is much more based on regions. Uh, traditionally, the European Union tried to promote the European model in different areas of the world. In Central America, the European Union is supporting the Central American Parliament and had been supporting the uh, Central American Parliament for 30 years, more or less. Uh, the same in the Andinian community, uh, encompassing Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, um, Bolivia as well. Uh, so the negotiation of free trade agreements uh, is always carried out by the European Union in terms of regional trade agreements in order to avoid 
a competition between areas of the same region producing the same goods, producing the same fruits or vegetables or dairy products and so on. So if you want to promote a, 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 a regional approach in terms of economic community, you have to negotiate free trade agreements uh, at regional level in, with a multilateral approach. Uh, nevertheless, it is sure that free trade agreements are quite often based on uh, a disbalanced approach, a, 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 some asymmetry. Everybody knows that the, the European agricultural sector is supported by a lot of incentives and a lot of funds uh, channeled by the European Commission to the different states and to the different regions within the European Union for supporting the agricultural sector everywhere. Not the same in the regions where we are negotiating free trade agreements. And this means that uh, the possibility of these countries to compete with products coming from the European Union uh, is not uh, harmonized, let's say, not based on the same facilities. Uh, just an example, a few years ago, a free trade agreement was negotiated between the European Union and Colombia within the uh, free trade agreement with the Andean countries. Uh, the dairy sector in Colombia is quite strong. It means milk, cheese, butter, and, and so on. Um, the dairy sector is quite strong in Colombia, but not able to compete with dairy products coming from Europe in terms of prices, because dairy products in, Euro in Europe are, are subsidized. Uh, so, in the framework of the free trade agreement between Colombia and the European Union, it was negotiated a sort of uh, grace period uh, allowing Colombia to update, adjust, improve their productivity level and arriving to the enforcement of the agreement with a reinforced capacity to compete in the, in the dairy sector. I was responsible for monitoring this process. That's why I know the, uh, I know the subject. Um, and uh, this is just one of the mechanisms allowing uh, to reduce the asymmetries uh, between uh, different countries when a trade agreement is set out. Nevertheless, one of the, one of the accusations, can we say accusations? Can we uh, allegement uh, made from the international uh, market to the European Union is that the European Union is uh, hiding tariffs uh, or hiding barriers uh, through the high level of safety requirements. Food safety is another another phase of the of, of the of the coin uh, food safety means to what extent i'm available to accept food from uh, from the rest of the world uh, but not not matching my requirement in terms of safety uh, the european union have the most uh, the most uh, the, the highest threshold in terms of food safety parameters and this creates substantial barriers to the incoming uh, food products from the rest of the world and this is one of the uh, one of the let's say uh, arguments against the European Union during the negotiation for free trade agreements uh, that we are using safety criteria, food safety criteria, food safety regulations 
for creating uh, trade barriers, which is, which is true or what I, but and not true on the other side. Look what's happening now after the Brexit. Uh, uh, Great Britain was sure to be able to negotiate with the United States a free trade agreement uh, in, in opening their market to the American market and solving their supply problems. But the, uh, safety, the food safety regulations in the United States are much lower in terms of quality than what has been adopted so far in, the, in Great Britain which corresponds to what had been adopted in the European Union. And this creates a, a new asymmetry because the British consumer is no longer available to accept low quality food coming from abroad. So it, 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 it's quite complicated, but it's interesting to introduce the, 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 sub, the issue of food safety within the framework of free trade agreements be, because it's part of the game. It is indeed. Thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting to hear. Um, and I would like to welcome the new auditors that are uh, being part of our, of our audience. And I would like to thank them for their participation and invite them to ask questions about uh, what we have been talking about, which was uh, the global economics, the impact of food systems of the global economy. And uh, uh, we have been talking globally and we have been talking locally. Uh, so um, the last topic was about uh, free trade agreements. And so I would add, uh, we uh, need to stress how important it is the role of institutions in assuring that uh, the food systems are being uh, organized so that the local and the global uh, remains somehow uh, equal and we all can uh, join of the benefits of uh, the food system uh, economy. Uh, so, um, Caitlin, would you like to add something about the food safety topic? I didn't have anything to say on the food safety, as a matter of fact, but I would like to add something about the agreements and especially the free trade agreements, the potential for free trade agreements in not only accelerating the global economy, but also maybe re-seeing the paradigm, re-seeing our vision of a free trade agreement in order that it also affects the uh, local economies uh, in uh, a positive way. And I think what Alessandro was saying previously about the asymmetries uh, and uh, the asymmetries of free trade agreements within food systems, I think can fit into the greater idea of this uh, new idea of South-South cooperation and the potentials that we see in South-South cooperation. And the leaders of South-South cooperation tend to be the BRICS countries. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And I think what the potentials of this new type of cooperation is that, uh, as we said before, if uh, there is more of a regional focus as opposed to a unilateral focus, uh, if it is applied to multiple countries and preferably countries of a similar geographical location and a similar socioeconomic context, I think we can begin to reimagine our idea of free trade agreements in a way that eliminates the asymmetries, both on a geopolitical scale and on a socioeconomic scale. And so, I think uh, when we think of the title of this event, Food Systems as Global Economy Accelerators, of course, free trade agreements have the potential to accelerate the global economy, but only if they are implemented in a multilateral way and preferably between countries of a similar socioeconomic standing, can they actually have the potential to benefit local levels of human development, uh, local producers, and local consumers. Uh, and uh, 
I think, it, yes, so that's uh, what I would like to say about uh, the, uh, the concept of uh, asymmetries and the, the new potentials of self-stop cooperation. Thank you, Caitlin, very insightful. And uh, Professor Kocki, uh, would you like to add something on the topic or uh, I would also like to go back to um, the people. So we have been talking about uh, the uh, regulations, the agreements, and uh, the institutions which are, which are fundamental. Uh, I would also like to go back to uh, the local aspect and to talk again about what is the anthropological aspect of uh, the global food systems in, and economics. So I'll leave the floor to Professor Kocki, and um, if you would like to add something to uh, the topics that we have been talking about, uh, we are really happy to hear you. Thank you. Uh, I perfectly agree with uh, what Kathleen said about the need for uh, strengthening of South-South cooperation. Um, I'm sure that that's the way uh, the European Union as well is stressing the importance of uh, fostering uh, the cooperation between uh, countries belonging to the same areas. Uh, it is not so easy be because uh, in many times the, uh, the economies of these uh, countries, similar countries, for example, both belonging to the tropics, are in competition for uh, for placing their products on the same markets, and, and the main markets are placed in the north of the planet. And so both countries belonging to the same tropical areas are competing for placing the same products in the north of the of, of, uh, the, of, the, of the America of the American continental or or in Europe, and they face the same problems in uh, competing on the global market, which complicates the, uh, the the agreement because they are competitors at the end of the day. And they are not always available uh, to to uh, to develop alliance on uh, on the global market. Uh, there is another. It, it can be interesting to promote exchange of experience, and definitely many projects financed by the European Union are promoting exchange of experience between African countries, for example, and uh, Latin American countries. Uh, I have been recently surprised uh, meeting people from Latin America who had experience uh, in Africa, in, in uh, tropical fruit production, for example, uh, and they were very, very happy of the experience of these kind of technical exchanges and so on. Uh, this is excellent from the scientific point of view, from the technical point of view. Uh, there are international research networks uh, encompassing different areas of the world. The CGR network, for example, is uh, a, an international network for the agricultural research. Uh, on uh, not only on tropical uh, products, but for everything, uh, rice, maize, wheat, uh, barley, and so on. And, uh, uh, but I see the difficulties, I recognize the difficulties in promoting free trade agreements between countries belonging to the same climatic areas and competing on the same market for the uh, for, and for the same uh, target market, which is always placed in the north of the planet, China, Russia, Europe, and North America. Uh, so we, we had to be very realistic 
the cooperation, the South-South cooperation can be uh, at a first stage promoted, but mainly in the framework of an exchange of experience, agricultural research, and, and things like that. Uh, trade agreements maybe will be the second step, but at this stage, I see, I, I recognize the difficulties. Anthropology, you introduced a very heavy subject, anthropology. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, anthropology is uh, a, an essential tool uh, which, which should be adopted at the beginning of any kind of intervention in the south of the world, but not only in the south, also in the north of the, uh, of the world, as a precondition for understanding the feasibility of an intervention, the feasibility of an action in the, con in the social context we are going to, uh, to operate. I remember many, many years ago, a, a, an immense irrigation project in the north of Nigeria. Uh, the engineers were absolutely convinced of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the value of their projects, <clears throat> excellent irrigation schemes, an excellent dam, an excellent organization proposal, and they didn't take into consideration uh, the social and, and cultural patterns of the areas where the project was going to be located. And at the end of the day, after billions of dollars spent in that project, the project was a failure. And it was not a failure because of a bad design or a, a, any bad calculation. It, it, it was not a math problem. It was just a problem of uh, acceptability. Uh, people, was forced, people were forced to work by night for respecting the irrigation term. And they didn't take into consideration that in many areas of Africa, including north of Nigeria, the night the night is populated by ghosts and spirits, and you don't go to the fields by night. That's all. You don't go to the fields by night. Uh, and, and, and this was not, you can imagine an Italian engineer at that time, 40 years ago. Uh, he was absolutely away from, uh, from the concept. But this was one of the reasons why this irrigation scheme failed. So anthropological patterns should be considered as a basic knowledge before uh, developing any kind of development project. I gave you an extreme example, of course, but just for memorizing uh, the, the, the issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Caitlin, would you like to add something? And then we have the last few minutes to answer to some questions that we have from our audience. Yeah, I think uh, my last comment before the questions come in is just going to come off of Alessandro. But I think uh, in my uh, little experience that I've had in uh, co international cooperation for development, I think uh, the thing that I've taken away from it all is uh, and we can also apply this to food systems specifically, is that if we try to apply what we see as a global concept on a local level without considering the needs of the local level and without interacting first at the local level with the people, the project will not be very useful for anyone in the end. The most productive and fruitful projects in international cooperation come from an initial exchange with, uh, in this case, for example, the producers or the farmers or the local people. And uh, that's how we go and we understand little nuances that maybe we don't immediately see because we're so busy thinking at a global level that we don't understand uh, the local at first. So I think there's a lot of humility that we have to have uh, before assuming that what we assume 
is a global international correct uh, concept uh, is actually not going to be that way for everyone. And this also applies for food production processes that applies to access to food uh, that maybe the foods that we think people want and we think people need are not necessarily the foods that they want and they need. And so uh, it applies to both the producer and the consumer in this sense. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So we have five minutes to answer the, the questions that we have from our audience. I would like to sum up um, some of uh, the, the interesting questions that we have to also sum up the today's event, because we have been talking about uh, local and global. And uh, lastly, um, about how the two uh, uh, topics are interacting with each other. So the, the, the question is, what is the role of food associations and aggregations of local farmers in determining uh, a more resilient local food systems? Can these organizations bring local producers on a regional path or to agricultural development? And in the end, what is the general pattern in your opinion more towards uh, global food systems or more towards local food systems. So I leave you uh, the floor and thank you very much. Alessandro, I can take the first question and you can go for the second. Okay, perfect. Right. Perfect. perfect. So I believe, uh, oh yeah, go. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I said before, uh, farmers associations, farmers cooperative, any kind of collective uh, way of producing is basic for reinforcing both local economy and the possibility to enter a globalized market. It's a precondition for everything. Uh, as I said before, uh, it is absolutely necessary for reinforcing food security at local level to have access to external services like input supply, credit, insurance mechanism, possibly, which is quite difficult at the moment, and uh, uh, other services like technical assistance, uh, agricultural advice, and so on. Uh, it is almost impossible to reach each farmer with these services because farmers are living in immense territories. The uh, farmer settlements are scattered uh, in uh, immense and vast areas in Africa, like in Latin America, Asia, and so on. So the only one way to reach these communities is just to organize them, to identify local team leaders, local leaders, to uh, prepare them, to train them in order to let them replicate the messages to the, to the local community and to channel some services through these leaders or local technicians trained at these purpose. So associations are essential both for giving and receiving, you know, for channeling the products outside the community, but also for receiving services from outside, from local institutions, national institutions, international cooperation for development projects and so on. And actually, I think Alessandro, you would be better adept at answering the second question. So I think I'm really? going to just uh, give an example of what okay. Alessandro was saying of the rural people living in the middle of nowhere. I saw an example in Zanzibar where a woman who uh, was living in the middle of an island in the mangroves and that was only accessible by a car three hours a day from the main island, for example, after she had started to take part in a cooperative, for example, all of a sudden she knew how to save money. Um, uh, you know, her coworkers, it's not necessarily something that, it's not necessarily knowledge that we brought, uh, but uh, just, uh, bridging the literal gap uh, between uh, this woman and a cooperative uh, of people who already knew how to save money and who already knew the best techniques uh, that they essentially knew everything already and they transmitted this knowledge to her 
Um, this is just an example of how powerful a cooperative is in reaching the most, uh, how can we say, isolated people. So, and uh, the second question as to if the tendency is more towards global or local systems, uh, I think I will leave to the agroeconomist. <laughs> um, well, I, I am not, I, I don't have any prejudice against globalization per se, as such. I mean, uh, 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 globalization is not the ideal. It, we, 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 it depends on how it's managed and, uh, how, and uh, who is the winner and who is the loser. I mean, a, a, a globalization process must be based on uh, the removal of asymmetries. It must be based on equity. It must be based on equality, pardon me. It must be based on equal starting conditions. Otherwise, globalization is an accelerator of diversities. It, globalization is an accelerator of inequality. Uh, so if we are talking about accelerators, we have to be very uh, aware that globalization is an accelerator of inequalities and asymmetries because the starting point is unequal for everybody. The multinationals companies already exist. Uh, the, the small producers have not access to the same services and to the same facilities as the big companies, already big players on the global market. So uh, we have to think on asymmetries, we have to focus our attention on inequality before uh, starting a globalization process, thinking that globalization is good and uh, for sure benefiting also local economy. It is not given for grant. It can even amplify the differences. It can even amplify asymmetries and inequality. So I, I don't have a preference well, I have a preference. I have, uh, uh, I'm much more oriented because of my experience on local economy than global economy. We also have to take into consideration the impact of globalization on climate change, uh, transportation, uh, the coal chains, uh, a lot of technical uh, implications of globalization are completely against uh, what we should do for mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, local economy is much more structured and much more feed for um, be climate smart. Uh, globalization is uh, based on long distance transportation, big boat, big airplanes, and, and so on. And, and this should be taken into consideration beyond any economic model, beyond any, uh, any political orientation as well. I, I mean, climate change is going to be a crucial uh, round point that we have to consider uh, even in the evaluation of what we have to promote uh, in terms of economic development model. Uh, and I think that local economy is retaking a crucial role, a pivotal role in, uh, uh, in uh, um, fighting against uh, global warming. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the uh, very insightful interventions and uh, thank you for our audience for following us during this event. Uh, we have, uh, our time is up, so uh, we are concluding this event and maybe we will talk about these topics uh, in another occasion. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists, Professor Alessandro Cocchi and Katie Rabe for being part of this event and sharing their knowledge with us.
And thank, thank you to the World Food Forum for having us uh, on their platforms. Um, I would like to have uh, to make a shout out to Mondo Internazionale, our association, um, for uh, being part of this event. And uh, come see us at, at mondointernazionale.org. Thank you very much for uh, your participation and uh, have a nice day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Much. Bye.